Welcome to the third season of That's So Second Millennium, the Catholic science podcast where we explore the fascinating borderlands between science and theology through realms of philosophy, human experience, and more. Richard W. Garrett is a unique activist in the field of education reform who never stops providing information and inspiration about America's youth and who eagerly collaborates to renew the future of our economy, even though he is well past what folks would consider his retirement age. In just the past several years, he has authored a book and produced a gallery of online videos aiming to make society's leaders, and all of us, more aware of the need to repair systemic problems in public elementary education. His impressive background in business, academia, and engineering yields particular insights into policies that have been proposed and are seen as workable, but generally aren't invested in. He plans to keep offering his authoritative voice to promising endeavors in his home state of Indiana or just about anywhere. He's looking for like-minded influencers, investing their time, talent, and treasure for the sake of young people for the next generation of teachers, and for a polarized society whose dysfunctional schools must be fixed. Paul and I spoke with Dick Garrett in July about the values, statistics, and challenges that energize him, hoping folks in our podcast audience might consider joining him in pursuit of political change and transformed attitudes. We'll present the interview in two parts, starting today. You'll find links in our accompanying show notes that will connect to him. Here's part one of our conversation. Well, Paul and I uh, welcome uh, Dick Garrett, who's uh, uh, become known to us because of his uh, really uh, exciting efforts in uh, education reform. But uh, he has a, a rich background, uh, now retired, but uh, he's been so active in uh, the uh, business of uh, education, the business of uh, engineering and science and math with uh, Lilly and, and other employers, and uh, just with uh, uh, a, a deep concern for students and for teachers and for now, especially the uh, elementary school level. Uh, he's doing uh, tremendous work, and uh, Dick, uh, it's been a, a, a pleasure uh, to get to know uh, the zeal that you bring to the uh, subject of reforming and repairing schools. Uh, you're, you're, well, I like your approach because it's um, uh, the problem-solving instincts of, a, of an engineer and business person, and uh, it's also a genuine compassion that you show for the students and, and teachers in our schools and how much they, they need our support and, and investment, increased investment. So that's all summed up in the title of your book, which is really one of the key points in our interview today. The book is titled, The Kids Are Smart Enough, So What's the Problem? And uh, that's a good question. In your own words, what do you, what do you mean by that title? And what, what is the, this, the statement there, the problem being referred to? Well, in the, um the basic uh, context of that book is to de- has to deal with the fact that many, many classrooms, and I say uh, 80,000 schools throughout America, which represents many, many classrooms, have a number of children who are so disruptive that they fairly dramatically reduce the amount of instruction time. And... Um, it's, it's kind of a hidden secret within the, the world of education because in my mind, a, 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 an, a, an existing teacher will not admit to that because in their heart of hearts, they believe it's their job to control these kids. But um, in the reality, uh, many of these children are not controllable. And I, I saw a video lecture the other day that said uh, not that many years ago, 32% of our American children were uh, poverty, poverty stricken. That's mm-hmm. now risen to 51%. And many of those are in single parents, usually the woman. 
And in order to provide for that family, they really have to scramble. And it has resulted in a uh, dramatic reduction of uh, non-cognitive skills. And I call these in the book character and grit. So uh, basically what's happening is that the teachers are not getting a fair chance to do their job. And uh, we blamed it on, uh, we meaning the teachers, I'm the facilitator, I'm not the decision maker, but the teachers uh, attributed it to three things. One was parenting, uh, one was uh, uh, culture, and the other, uh, particularly as the kids get older, they choose to be uh, disruptive. It's just a, a, an acting out of, of ways to waste class time so they don't have to learn, in my opinion. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the point. But subsequent to that, I have moved on to uh, many higher level issues uh, dealing with global education and where we rank. So it was basically a transition that I was preparing myself for, for people when they asked me, so what are we going to do about it? And I think as a businessman, you know, I would never make a presentation without an answer to that question. So um, anyway, that's the background. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that they are smart enough. Okay. Um, not a people don't believe that, but I, I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a lot of it, uh, a lot of the debate in our political realm does directly or indirectly revolve around, uh, you know, are they smart enough? Is there something uh, uh, systemic? Uh, not, so, not necessarily are they smart enough uh, going in, but are they smart enough coming out? Uh, it's a matter of justice, not a matter of, of critiques of, of people's backgrounds or anything. Uh, but it's, it sounds like you uh, bring that extra voice of business to the equation and and you're saying it's it's not about these particular characteristics in a determinative way uh, a lot can be addressed by looking at the the systems that are producing these problems uh, sustaining these challenges and uh, that there can be some uh, switches around in the in the system of education to uh, to uh, resolve these problems yes and, and you, you bring up a good point in the, in the uh, maryland study which was approved by the legislature in march of this year uh, they put out a huge report 270 pages they call it the Kerwin report for bill Kerwin, who was the leader the former chancellor of the maryland system and they make a statement in there that they, they really don't think it's the kids, it's the system that is letting these kids down. And they then come up with ways to fortify the system so that the kids won't be let down. And I think that's why that study is so significant. Basically what they found, a state that has been ranked in the past as the number one state in the nation, um, they got beaten out by Massachusetts, which had a similar reform in 1993. And, 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 uh, and now Maryland is jealous. They want to be better than Massachusetts. But they found in their elaborate study that only 40% of their students were properly prepared for either college or a career, a vocational career. 40%. And so I... I view this as a major system calibration issue. Uh, how can a, uh, a state be ranked number one in the past and now number four or five and only educate properly 40% of their children? The only way you come up with these conclusions is when you use international benchmarking. And that's what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Comparing mm -hmm. ourselves to other systems. Uh, in, in the world. So anyway, did I answer their question? Yeah, and, and it sounds like the, uh, the metrics uh, uh, worldwide uh, tell uh, an equally disturbing story as the domestic statistics, uh, that, that we, we rank uh, way, way down the list in, in, a lot of the, uh, in a lot of the outcomes. Uh, we rank 
on probably in the 40s in math and probably in the high 20s in, uh, in reading. Mm. So we're middle of the pack. By the way, if Massachusetts were a country, they'd be in the top 10, thereby proving in my mind that its capability is there. Mm -hmm. All we need to do is change the system to capture it. Could you walk us through some of the specific metrics that we're talking about here in terms of what it is that we're really lagging behind? And, you know, it's interesting that reading is actually even further behind than math for example, but what are, what are the, no, what are we hoping is, to do? Math is further uh, down than reading. Reading was in the high twenties. Math is in the, the high thirties. Oh, uh, high twenties being from zero being the highest rather yeah, than zero, being the highest. Right number one, which would probably be Singapore, Hong Kong. There you go. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I, I have a whole litany of things that I talk about. Let me start down that list. The, the first one is these international rankings where we are uh, middle of the pack. Mm -hmm. The next one is by the National Center for Educational Assessment, the U.S. Department of Education. We basically haven't changed our performance in 40 years. Mm -hmm. And during those 40 years, the Department of Education has introduced many initiatives. Yeah. John left behind, uh, every person is a good instructor and all these things. And uh, no results. But the most disturbing to me is the assessments of adult uh, capabilities. It's another international program, very Mm -hmm. large and very active. When I first started uh, my research, probably in 2013, uh, if you ask what percentage of the U.S. high school population is uh, functionally illiterate, the number would be around 19%. Mm-hmm. Recently, it's grown to 28%. Yeah. In America, the numerical skills, we are now 38% of our graduates do not have numerical skills well developed at all. Back to reading. Um, mm-hmm. when, when I say functionally literate, these readers have the capability of a 10 year old student, not a 10th grader, but yeah. a 10 year old student. And in the area of digital skills, we uh, 33% of our graduates cannot use a computer to solve a simple problem. Right. You know, like a simple spreadsheet or something like that. They just can't yeah. do it. Then when you multiply these out, I, I think the first one is eight or 900,000 graduates can't read. How can we consider our system to be anywhere close to where we want it Mm -hmm. if we don't look at things like that. Now, what a lot of people do look at is graduation rates and so forth. But as we know, graduation rates don't mean a lot because a lot of times they don't get diplomas. Right. They get get something else. The 80, I've got a a number that I use, 80,000 schools. I get back to that, back to what I said a while ago about, uh, a survey that was done in uh, 2004 by a good outfit in in Brooklyn called the, uh, uh, can't remember, Uh, but they uh, surveyed a bunch of parents and a bunch of teachers and 80% of those felt that we have major issues in the classroom, disruptive issues that are taking away from time. It was called Teaching Interrupted Mm -hmm. uh, by uh, uh, Public Agenda is the name of the company, the consulting mm-hmm. firm. Andre Schrecker, who is the most knowledgeable person of, uh, of education in the world, a German who heads up the international program, he makes a statement. A lot of other people make it, but the quality of a country's education is a, is a good predictor of their future economic viability. Right. And in speeches that I give, folks, we're in trouble. Yeah. You know, we are in trouble. Uh, We are going downhill, not uphill. Yeah. Competencies are getting worse. Yeah. Oh, the other thing, one more thing. We need about 300,000 teachers a year. Current projection, uh, this is by a lady out of Stanford and a a team. Um, We're only going to get 100,000. So we're going to be 200,000 short. Yeah. Four year trained students in education. Yeah. All those things go together to really paint a very bleak picture. Mm-hmm. 
So, and just focusing on the teachers for a minute, uh, they are just as frustrated as any uh, business person or uh, uh, person on the, uh, you know, the external end, uh, uh, the endpoint of the education system. Huh? They, uh, they, 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 they are trying, and they do see that the kids are smart enough, but there are these uh, systematic problems. And uh, what would be uh, what would be a few of the systematic problems and cures that you you want uh, and that the Kerwin Commission wants to uh, focus on primarily? Well, I'm going to give you one that is not in the Kerwin not in the Kerwin report, but that is the uh, some protection for schools against lawsuits. Yeah. The the prevalence of lawsuits, the threat and the actuality of lawsuits are hamstringing administrators. Mm -hmm. Now, the last thing they need is to spend $150,000 on a lawsuit. And we need some uh, protection from frivolous lawsuits, many of which are purely retribution mm -hmm. for the way a kid got treated, mistreated in the eyes of the parent. Yeah. But going on to the Maryland uh, uh, study, there are... Uh, three or four major building blocks. Uh, the first of which is to pay the teachers a salary commensurate with their education. Yeah. And what they do in that report is they take a lot of jobs that are four year jobs and they average them out and they get $80,000 a year, 12 month year for uh, their compensation. And that's where they set their average teacher compensation for the future that the average teacher will be making about eighty thousand dollars and that they have a career path they can rise up the ladder become a master teacher and a master teacher you would not have to spend your entire day in the classroom you would be doing things that are now done by the superintendent's office uh, such as picking curriculum or improving lessons or whatever Mm -hmm. So they spend a lot of time on Kaizen, never ending improvement. Mm -hmm. The second and most fundamental, now, now I don't know, salaries are really fundamental, but the next thing is um, the uh, issue of uh, educating our poor. Mm -hmm. If you look at the charts from around the world of the really good systems, they educate their poor. And I did a, a, an analysis of uh, collaborative uh, learning. Mm -hmm. And if we could educate our most deprived students, socially, uh, economically deprived students, 8% better, and then move the entire curve up, up to the right, uh, we would be world class. So it doesn't sound like much, but when you look at these results that come from the assessment center of the Department of Education, 8% is huge. Yeah. So, but it's not insurmountable. So, um, the next thing is Maryland did is they hired 15,000 more teachers. And many of these teachers will be uh, working with pre K students. Mm -hmm. They'll be working in small class sizes for the, the uh, poor people. They don't see a need to have small class sizes for everybody, but they do for poor people. For example, my daughter-in-law uh, took a, a kindergarten class this year with uh, a school district in the west side of Indianapolis, and of her 26 kids, 17 of them didn't really know what a book was. They didn't know what the front was. They didn't know what the back was. They had no idea how to hold it, no idea how to read it. The, uh, the other kids did, but um, you can't enter kindergarten in today's world without some basic reading skills, at least, you know, where the page is and, and where to start on the book. So um, that's another one. You, the other one is you have to set very high standards. One of the, one of the things that uh, most uh, really good international systems do is the majority of their students go vocational. Mm -hmm. So you need a very good vocational path. And this is very motivating to kids. Mm -hmm. They can see the end of this journey. They can see themselves as a, 
I'm not going to say a, a carpenter because if you get into the skills of, you know, they might learn how to run a gas chromatograph and work right. in a lab. Yeah. Or, yeah. I work with a kid who uh, got a certification in software analysis, mm -hmm. high school. Yeah. So yeah. these kids have jobs waiting for them when they come out. So those are some of the things that need to be changed um, in order to get us closer to the people that used to emulate us yeah. who we are now emulating. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. so the, uh, the Maryland legislators have seen the wisdom of these recommendations uh, and they, they passed uh, the legislation required for the uh, relatively hefty uh, but understandable uh, funding levels involved. Uh, I guess because of COVID-19, uh, things have been put on hold at the moment by the governor, but that there is the hope that uh, whatever veto or whatever he ex exercised might uh, come off. And your, your goal is to show uh, that uh, this should go beyond Maryland now, right? I'm up currently in Wisconsin. I am uh, working hard to meet with the head of the Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. in the state of Wisconsin to talk about replicating the Maryland study in this state. I would love to do it in Indiana. I would love to do it in any state that I could. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have the skills personally to lead that study. They ought to get a, you know, a very prominent citizen to lead it. But then you bring in the experts, not me, but guys like Mark Tucker, Andre Schrecker, the very best in the world. You bring them in and they help you understand why you are headed in the direction you're headed in, why you should head in that direction. So the amount of the cost of this thing, uh, the Maryland budget. Um, oh, by the way, there was one other issue the governor uh, vetoed the bill about, and that's where the money is going to come from. What the legislator yeah. did, they tossed him that ball without any recommendation of how to get the money. Oh, and right. he's not about to stick his neck out to yeah. uh, recommend that. So it'll go back. They did, however, start funding the program mm -hmm. to start the early steps of the change. Huh. So that's, it wasn't just dead in the water. Uh, it, uh, it can go forward uh, from there. But it was $3.8 billion is the cost uh, of a $7 billion existing education budget in the state of Maryland. They want a major increase in it. Mm -hmm. um, it's huge. But in my opinion, we're so far underfunding it now that we need to do this to make up. They did a really excellent study on the return on the investment and they ended up being in study state about 6.3 billion a year back to the state of Maryland, mm -hmm. primarily in tax revenues from people who now have jobs yeah. that didn't used to graduate and get jobs or if they graduated, they weren't prepared and uh, a large part of that uh, 6.3 billion is increased tax revenue, but there are also reduced draws on social expenditures like incarceration, yeah. like Medicaid and so yeah. forth. Unemployment. I, I, did, I looked at the study, I studied it hard, and I believe it. There is also an additional component in there they don't even bring up, and that's the federal uh, improvements. Mm -hmm. State taxes generally are less than uh, federal, yeah. So uh, they didn't even account for that because it doesn't go back to the state of, of Maryland. Right. So anyway. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That's part one of our interview with Dick Garrett. You don't need to agree with every one of his points or his ways of expressing them to agree that education and public education in particular in the United States is in serious need of reform and it's a, that it's an issue of justice as well as an issue of economic importance in particular, that we need to treat teachers in this country like the professional and highly important people in our society that they really are, and among other things, to compensate them accordingly. We'll air part two of this interview in early August. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of That's So Second Millennium. TSSM's audio producer is Morgan Burkhardt. Our theme music, Igneous Grok, was composed and performed by Vin Marquardt. For my co-host Bill Schmidt, I'm Paul Geesting. Until next time.